So we are going to talk about changing variables in the context of double integrals and why we have to multiply by the Jacobian, what exactly that value means in terms of computing volumes. In order to do that, we first have to get a better understanding of what u substitution means in the context of single variable integrals. We have to think about that more in terms of geometry than the way we often learn it, which is in terms of algebra. So let's say we have the function f of x and we want to integrate it on the range from a to b. In that case, we can think about the graph of f of x, something like this, and we define a beginning point a and ending point b. In order to calculate this area, we split this region into a bunch of rectangles. And then we're going to add up the areas of all of these rectangles to approximate the area of our curve. And then as we add more and more rectangles, our measurement becomes more precise. The question is, how does this geometry change when we make a change of variables? So let's say we wanted to substitute x equals g of u. This is sort of an implicit substitution, but this kind of weird backward substitution is actually the way that we do substitutions in multiple variables. And that's how the Jacobian ends up being calculated. In this case, we're going to get a new integral with some other bounds, we'll call them alpha and beta, determined by the substitution. And then if we plug in x equals g of u, and then we'll have a du out here. The question is, is there anything missing from this new integral? And we want to understand that geometrically. So I'm going to hop into MATLAB and we'll take a look at how this substitution has affected the Riemann sum. So in the top left of the screen here, you can see the graph of f of x that we were looking at a second ago. That's this blue curve right here. And the rectangles underneath that are the Riemann sum from the bounds of 0 to 1. On the right side, we're looking at a particular function g of x that we're going to substitute into the input of that function. So g has this particular shape. And then down here, these are the values of g prime of x. What we want to look at is what happens when you plug in f of g of x. How does that affect the shape of the rectangles under the Riemann sum? So now in the bottom left, we see the graph of f of g of x. And we see that it has a similar shape to this original curve up here. But in some places, that graph has been squished down. And in some places, it's been significantly stretched out. And what we want to look at is how that relates to the values of g of x and g prime of x. Notice g prime of x is very, very large, close to the value of 1, which is the starting value, the lowest value on this bottom left graph here. So over there, the value of g prime of x is very large. The function has been squished down a lot. All the rectangles on the top left are exactly the same color on the bottom left graph. So we can see that the red rectangles at the left of our graph have almost no length on the bottom left because g prime is so high. On the other hand, these blue rectangles on the right side of the graph have gotten stretched out a ton. And that's because once we get to those larger values, g prime of x is much smaller than 1. So what this is telling us is that the width of those rectangles is changed based on the value of g prime of x. For a higher value of g prime of x, the rectangles get squished down. And for a low value, they are stretched out. Now our goal here is to be able to add up the rectangles on the bottom left, but get the same value for the Riemann sum as on the top left. Notice all of the rectangles, if we look at the rectangles of the same color, they all have the same height. The only difference is in the width. And that width is determined by how much they were squished. So if we want to reverse that squishing, so we get rectangles with the same width as before, what we have to do is multiply by g prime of x. Because that determines the factor by which those widths are squished down. So if we stretch them out by the same factor, we get back the original width. So that's the reason we multiply by g prime of x when we're looking at these substitutions. 
It's because that value corresponds to the amount of length contraction that occurs when we substitute these rectangles in a new Riemann sum. So the value of g prime of u that we multiply on the inside of the integral is really a measure of how much each of these lengths, the lengths of these rectangles, has been squished. If we know the factor by which they've been squished, we stretch them out by that same factor, and then we'll get the correct area as a result. Now we have to think about taking this idea and transitioning it to multiple dimensions in order to calculate the Jacobian. So now that we have an understanding of the contraction of lengths, we have to think about how that applies when we're looking at areas. In the case where we're mapping from x to u, we notice that there's a one-dimensional input space that's being stretched or squished, and that corresponds to the basis of these rectangles. But when we're looking at a double integral, we have a two-dimensional input space. In this case, we have both an x and y axis that both correspond to inputs. And the areas of these rectangles in the input space, those are the bases. Because just like we calculate the areas of rectangles for Riemann sums, in the case of double integrals, we're actually finding the volumes of rectangular prisms. And in that case, the height is going to be f of x, y, but the base is the area that's spanned by a particular input rectangle. So how much areas get scaled, squished, or stretched in 2D input space, that's how much the base is being contracted, and that affects the volume in the same way the contractions of length affected the area in the single variable case. So what we have to think about is how much areas are getting squished or stretched as we map from the space of x, y onto u, v. And the way this works is we could define functions, for example, x equals 2u plus v and y equals u plus 2v, where we're defining new variables u and v implicitly in terms of x and y. When we do this, we're going to get a new output space that maybe looks something like this. So our goal is to find out how much area has been squished down when we map from x, y to u, v, because then we can multiply that to get back our original volume. But the Jacobian actually does something kind of clever. See, the thing about linear transformations is we have a tool to find how much areas get scaled up and that is the determinant. The determinant of a matrix A talks about how much area has been scaled up by the matrix. But instead of finding how much area gets scaled up, what we do is find how much area gets stretched going in the opposite direction. That corresponds to the fact from linear algebra that the determinant of an inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of the original matrix. So we're going to look at the backwards mapping and ask how much is area stretched when we go the opposite direction. So let's think about how that works. The idea of a matrix is that each number represents a particular mapping from an input to an output. In this case, as we do this backwards mapping, what we're doing is mapping u and v values to x and y values. So the first entry in this matrix, for example, the top left entry, is talking about how x is affected by changes in the value of u. So what we want to think about now is how partial derivatives come into this expression. When we think about, for example, the partial derivative of x with respect to u, what is this talking about? Well, it's saying when u is changed, how does that affect the change in x? If this partial derivative is very large, what that means is that a small change in u corresponds to a much larger change in the value of x. So in that case, if a small change in u is getting mapped to a big change in x, that's talking about areas getting scaled up. So when we think about u being mapped to x, that really comes down to the partial derivative of x with respect to u. 
the bigger that is, the more the length of the rectangle in that direction is going to get scaled up because that comes down to the fact that there's a bigger length with respect to x than with respect to u. The same thing applies for everything else in this matrix. If we look at u getting mapped to y, that comes down to the partial derivative of y with respect to u. And over here on the right side, we just have dx dv and dy dv. So this matrix represents the backwards transformation from uv back to xy. And if we want to find out how much areas are getting scaled, that is the definition of the determinant. So if we take the determinant of this matrix right here, that is the Jacobian. It talks about how much areas get scaled backwards. So if we want our original transformation from xy to uv, this determinant is asking how much does area get squished, exactly what we need to multiply to get back the original volumes of our rectangles. So let's do one specific example of a Jacobian determinant so that this idea makes sense in a more concrete way. Let's say we want to find the Jacobian determinant for the mapping x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. This is what you might recognize as a mapping onto polar coordinates. And what we can do is use the Jacobian determinant to figure out how much area is getting squished in this case. If we do that out, what we're going to get for the Jacobian right here is the determinant of, we'll have r as our first variable, so dx dr dy dr. And then over here, theta is our second variable, dx, d theta, and dy, d theta. If we do this out, dx dr is going to be just cosine theta. dy dr is just going to be sine theta. dx d theta is negative r sine theta. And dy d theta is r cosine theta. So if we multiply this out, we're going to get cosine theta times r cosine theta is r cosine squared theta. And then we have minus a negative r times sine squared theta. Notice here a minus a minus becomes just a plus. So we have r times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. That's just going to give us r as our answer. So r is the Jacobian determinant for this substitution of variables. One last thing I have to mention here is that we actually take the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant. Depending on how you calculate it, for example, if we had actually switched r and theta in this matrix calculation here, we would have gotten negative r instead of r. So it has the same absolute value. All we have to do is take the magnitude to get rid of that negative sign because we're just talking about how areas are getting squished and areas are always going to be positive. So that's where the Jacobian determinant formula comes from. When we do single variable u substitutions, the extra factor of g prime of u is talking about how much lengths get squished due to the higher derivatives of u. When we map from two variables to two other variables, rather than lengths being the base of our rectangles, we have squares being the basis of a rectangular prism. And therefore, we're looking at how much area gets squished. In order to do that, we actually go backwards and talk about how much area gets stretched in the reverse direction. That's why we have our original variables x and y on the top rather than on the bottom. It's because we're going in the opposite direction to talk about how much the backwards transformation stretches area. Then we go in the other direction to talk about how much area gets squished. And therefore, this is exactly what we want the value of the Jacobian determinant.